three questions that I was asked by my professors when I was in college studying communication studies included, who am I, who are you, what are we doing here together? Those same three questions have followed me in my classes as I ask those to my students and my students ask those same three questions in the work that they do, whether it's a speech, a paper, or a presentation. So today, I have the great honor of asking those three questions, who am I, who are you, what are we doing here together, to two individuals who I've got a chance to get to know through both being in a classroom setting and being a listener and a reader. Two of the guests that we'll be featuring today will share with us some of their own personal experiences, as well as talk more about how we can address those questions, not only in speeches, but through storytelling. I'm Lori Holfer Sumwenti, an instructor of communication studies, and with me are two amazing women who have asked the same questions. I've heard stories about their lives, their families, their ancestors, and indeed hope for the future. Each of you have gifted me as a listener, and I know that the audiences, whether it was with Cindy in our public speaking class, or Kalkalia in the most recent presentation that you gave, where I think almost everyone was brought to tears as you shared information and stories about healing from loss and looking forward in the future. I'd like to, first of all, share my screen, and that way I can give you just a little bit more information about our featured speaker. So Kalkalia is a writer, a speaker, a poet, and so much more. She's shared her stories with audiences that I've been involved with both virtually as well as in live settings. I've shared your speeches in my class, both intercultural communication, public speaking, and plan to in interpersonal communication. Folks across the curriculum, enjoy your stories, enjoy your writing, and well, your speaking, because you really speak to the heart of individuals. And this is just a chance for people to see by sharing my screen, all of the many different ways that Kao Kalia Yang has touched people's lives with her stories and her work and her hope. I'm also going to share with you a little information about our second speaker. We also have with us Cindy Ta, and she is one of my past students in public speaking. She had an opportunity to share her story through her Culture in the Backyard speech, which she has gifted to individuals on the website that we use for our textbook. And so not only has she shared with audiences in the classroom that I was involved in, albeit virtual, but also many students in the future will hear stories about her life, but more importantly, will have a sense of representation beyond just one individual, but seeing more folks and more folks' stories in our curriculum. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Thank you very much for moderating, and I'll step back and listen to your conversation. All right. Hi, guys. My name is Cindy Tao, and I am a student at Metro State, a former student of Lori. Um, and I had a lot of fun in her class, um, whether doing speeches or being able to tell stories of my background, uh, which was very fun for me. And I hope that, you know, in the future, a lot more students also is able to tell those stories as well. Um, and for today, we do have a special guest. Would you be able to uh, introduce yourself? Yes, I'm happy to. Hello, Cindy, and hello, Lori. I'm Kao Kalia Yang. You can call me Kalia. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a writer. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a public speaker. I'm a teacher as well. So across all of the spectrums of the things I am, I try to prioritize being honest and being present. So I'm super happy to share this next hour with both of you and with all of you, listeners, audience. All right, so I'll go ahead and start uh, with the first question. Um, in what ways do you prepare to share a story or prepare to ask uh, another about their story? That is a lovely question. In what ways do I prepare myself to share my stories or to welcome the stories of others? I think welcoming is key when it comes to me being a good listener. I understand that our words are, in, are our gifts to the world, to each other. And so to accept other people's words, even when they are hard to hear, 
as something that, that comes from deep inside of them, as something that is valuable and that should be honored, as something that I try, I try to, to live. I'm not saying I always do it well, especially with my children after a long day, but I, I do try. It is important for me to know and for the people for the person speaking with me to know that I'm listening and I'm thinking about the things that you're saying. I'm welcoming them into the space of my world. And that's super important to me. As a storyteller and as a writer, as a public speaker and a teacher, what is always important for me is to meet people where they are. So I don't make assumptions. Going into anything at all, professionally, personally, I go with an open heart and an open mind. I go with a sense of anticipation. And I try to carry with me a spirit of joy. And I think this has so much to do with not only um, alleviating the burden that we all feel sometimes in trying to understand each other, but also in just creating a space where we're, where we're comfortable, comfortable adventuring into the discomfort of being, being together, being by ourselves. I understand that learning, whether this is through stories or through you know, writ the written format, whatever, whatever medium it is. It is possible only when we feel that, yes, I can do this. And so that is what I try to communicate um, as a storyteller. Yes, you can listen to me. Yes, by the end of this, you will understand me better. But beyond that, you will understand yourself better. And together we will have explored a little bit more of the world that we share. And Cindy, I say this all the time to my students. If I say something that doesn't quite make sense to you, please make sure to call me on it. Um, give me an opportunity to, to engage with you where you are. Sounds good. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then uh, in your opinion, how do stories or narratives and speeches uniquely communicate to others? Voice is this beautiful vehicle. My dad has an incredible voice, Cindy. He sings traditional Hmong song poetry. When he's singing, you don't have to understand the words to feel because the voice becomes this vehicle for all of his feelings, not just his thoughts. And I think sometimes in communication, particularly in this American context, we're so focused on words that we get lost, um, that we don't employ the power of the voice. And so for me, the voice is key. And it, my, my relationship to my voice goes way back, you know. I grew up as a selective mute in English, so I didn't talk. And in all of those years of not talking, I, I hated my voice because every time I tried, it would be so rusty. You could hear, you could hear that the language was heavy on me and that I was caving underneath its weight. It took me a long time to grow comfortable with this voice that I have. I remember when I first became a writer and there, was, there were opportunities to do audiobooks. My younger sister said, no, Kalia, your voice is so grating. Please don't, please don't. And I'm like, they're right. But then I'm like, are they right? If this voice is the vehicle that I have, if I love my father's voice, if I love my mother's voice, shouldn't I love this voice that they've gifted me with? And so... Now I understand, yes, it is my words, but it is also my voice that is carrying my message to a bigger world. Yeah, I really, really love that. Um, it's very touching and inspirational. Um, and then I know that you've written a book about someone that I actually know. Um, it's actually The Shared Room. Yes. Uh, yeah, that family is actually about my aunt losing her child. It was very... Um, it was a really hard time for um, our whole relatives and family because we were also going through another tragedy. Um, but, you know, knowing that you've written a story about someone that I personally know, um, it was very special because, you know, everybody saw them going through a lot of grief. And, you know, we just didn't know what we can do to help them. All we could do is, you know, just be there but what else can we do um, but when I heard that you wrote a book about the story um, I did see them you know they did cope with the loss a lot better and you know everything got really well after that so it was really nice to um, hear your story that you were able to write about them so I really thank you for that and then on to the next question yeah before the next question, oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to apologize for your loss. Oh, no You're problem. Such a beautiful, 
such a beautiful little girl in a light. Yeah, she was. And the yeah. story, you know, the story remains. Mm -hmm. At the end of the month, uh, her parents, Sai and Jim, will be reading from the shared room and are reading them organizing the McDonough Housing Project. I don't know if you both know, but I'm a kid from the Housing Projects of St. Paul. Oh, and yeah. I've always wanted to, to go back. I wanted to return. Because I've always thought, you know, in all of those years when I was living in the housing projects, if I had seen a writer who 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 had emerged from this place, wouldn't that have been so incredible? Mm -hmm. And so at the end of this month, I'm doing like this open and free reading. And for that particular title, I've asked Jenna's mom and dad if they wanted to read the book. Mm -hmm. And they both said yes. So I look forward to seeing your aunt and uncle soon and the whole family. It's such a gift that they trusted me with the story. I wrote that book with their permission, you know, and with their blessing. And so it's, I mean, the beautiful thing about our community is how connected we are, right, Cindy? Yeah. So it is, it is lovely to see these connections come into play, but on perhaps on a deeper level, how they have always been in play. Thank you. All right. And so the next question is, uh, how do oral and written verbal communication channels differ? Ooh, that is so good. So I come from a family of great oral uh, storytellers. As you know, most of our elders uh, were illiterate in that we could read and write. Of course, you could read things like the direction of the wind blowing or the dancing of flames, but it was, it's an entirely different kind of form that I'm working in. The truth is I know that the oral form is harder because with your words, with the, with the music that is inside of your voice, you have to hold captive an audience. You have to memorize these elements of story. On the written page, I have something to rest on. In many ways, I tell the stories with a crutch. You know, when I'm standing up there with a book, I know that if I forget everything, I just go down and the words are right there. Um, in the oral form, you don't have this kind of structure. So it's a harder form. Um, and then I know that through my speech, um, and through all the speeches I give, the reality is that many times, for example, yesterday when I was the keynote for Opera America, which I never expected, I never thought that I would be invited to the biggest operatic conference in the nation and that I would open a keynote for this really kind of exclusive and elite community of performers and arts direction. Um, and yet there I was, and I knew, Cindy, that many of them had no idea who I was. It was a national conference, so who's this like short little woman standing on top of like a really tall stool, strangely, you know, floating above everyone else, um, which meant that I had to situate them first in who I am before I could get to the meat of my messaging. Um, so it's, 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 again, there I'm moving much closer to the oral form that has raised me in the written form, which in many ways has begun my life in terms of a public sphere. Um, and, but public speaking in that way, I, I think I approach it the way I do because of the oral tradition that has raised me. Because I know that there's a magic that happens when you look at someone and you say, this is something I know, this is something I believe to be true. And this thing that I believe to be true is true of you as well. Um, I, so, so the kind of presence that you need in, when, or that I need when I'm doing a public performance is different than the work that I do when I go onto the page to write. I can write in my pajamas. I can write, you know, I can write in my sweat gear. I can do, I can write in the privacy of my sphere. Um, there is a public element, a public performance element when it is the oral, uh, oral delivered in, in, in that format that challenges me to perhaps look a little bit cleaner, to stand a little bit straighter, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so as a full holistic exercise of the body, um, the speaking is much harder. The oral form is much harder. As an exercise of the mind, it is equally hard. As an exercise of the heart, it is equally hard. But I wouldn't be a public speaker today if I weren't a writer first. And that's just, it says more about me perhaps than it says, anything about anything else because I come from such a humble space of being you know people wondered what I had to say to the world without the books many people many of the audiences that I've had would have never been there and so I understand that in the words of my daddy I can't just go into the world with a shield or a sword I needed both 
And now that there's like nine books in the world around me, it's like the, the love army of Kalkalia Yang girls, right? Many times somebody will have read a children's book and they'll be there for like a formal talk. Other times, you know, they will have studied and read me with a teacher like Lori, and then they're meeting me. And so does the body meet up with the words, right? It becomes a different um, equation. But all of these things, context, context has so much to do with how I see both forms. The objective for me has always been the same though, Cindy. Every time I speak, every time I write, I want to show people what it's like to see and to feel and to experience the world from where I'm positioned, where so many of us are positioned as women, all three of us, you know, in your case, in my case, Cindy, as Hmong women, refugee women, women who are growing up and new to this landscape of Americanness. Um, so yeah, lots of things. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and can you share more about how this is often culturally influenced? So um, in my family, my grandpa died a long time ago. And so my grandmas, both on both sides, they've been the matriarchs of their families. One grandma I never met, one, one grandma, you know, I knew and loved, and she loved me tremendously. Um, these relationships, I think, with the elders and the women particularly in my life have so much to do with who I am and how I express myself. You know, when my grandma spoke, the grandma that I knew and loved, she spoke expecting us to listen to her. And I think that gives me a kind of courage um, that many people don't see when they look at Hmong women. They don't see that I come from, that, that so many of us come from matriarchs because we come from a war that has decimated and destroyed so many of the men living or dead in our lives. And so I'm led by incredibly strong women. My mom and my aunts, they all hold the money in the different families. And that says a lot about how they choose to spend that money. I mean, there's been many studies about how when a woman holds the money, how much of that money is used to support the children. And that has certainly been my experience being a Hmong American child, you know? When my mom had money, she saved it so that we could go on the school field trips. She saved it so that we could, you know, we could buy that yearbook at the end of the year that we're so excited for. These things were important to her. And so I've always, you know, despite the messaging from a bigger community, I've always understood where the power was in my life, you know? I love, I love language and I love language because I'm the daughter of a song poet, my father and Biya. But I'm able to do the work that I do with my love of language because I'm Jumwa's daughter. I'm not mistaken about this fact at all. And so I think culturally speaking, I am who I am exactly because I am the descendant of many powerful and unknown women of history. Yeah. And, you know, the Hmong culture is often said to be an oral culture. Um, how else do you think that the Hmong culture has been preserved or has preserved their history, story, culture through nonverbal ways? Music, because I'm the, you know, my dad, obviously. So, you know, all of the art instrumentation, mm -hmm. I think, is exquisite. And I, I, I've never been able to blow on a leaf, but I know that like even the blowing of a leaf becomes a vehicle for the stories of your heart, stories of your mind. Um, so definitely music, but also we are known internationally for our incredible embroidery, right? Hmong women in the camps started sewing all of our stories down, all of these stories that they knew were absent from the history of a bigger world. And they did it with exquisite needlework and technique. And so that I think has been something that we've been able to really beautifully showcase to, to, to the international community, to be, to be honest. Um, and then of course, there's the food and the traditions and the rituals that govern all of us. When the COVID pandemic started, um, you know, my uncle, Fi Yang, and he had all these strings and they tied them around our wrist. Those strings got so thin that they started falling loose. And then my dad, you know, did it again. And then their new strength, but even this one you can see is so, is so, I mean, it's thinning out. I'm just waiting for the day it falls, right? And, and I have in my keeping, my jewelry box, all of the strings 
from my whole life. And they tell a, a, a kind of story. The biggest batch of the strings are actually when I got married. With 500 guests from all kinds of cultures, you know, tie these strings because of the strings of my tradition. With their good words, they tie their wishes onto my wrists. I've kept them all. And that for me is a story, Cindy. It's a way of preserving the culture and the memory, the people who are part of my life. And so personally, I have like this document, this stash of like frayed strings, right? But, but beyond that, even the clothing. In my closet upstairs, I have one shirt that belongs to my grandma. When she died, I don't know uh, where everything went, but somehow in the wash of everything, I got one shirt and one string that my grandma had made using plastic bags from grocery stores. She used to cut them into strips and then roll them into ropes. I have them. The string is as strong as it ever was. The shirt no longer smells like my grandma. It's been in my closet for so long, for like, you know, 18 years almost, but it hangs. And every year I get closer to the woman who wore that shirt, not further away. Time has a way of holding pieces of ourselves for us. And so, yeah, memories for me is also an incredible way of preserving the culture and the language and the story of who I am. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, how has your personal family preserved the stories of you guys from the past? What ways do they uh, preserve it? Oh, that is such a good question. So when we came from Thailand, um, several of my aunts, they brought like single seeds with them. And one aunt was scared that there wouldn't be like mong cilantro. And so she put one seed in her pocket. And now that seed has flowered lots of cilantro across our different yards, right? Another aunt put like two mustard seeds, Cindy, tiny little mustard seeds. And now we're able to eat zhong jua and zhong ba, mm -hmm. you know, mong greens from the homeland. So our gardens also tell a story of where we've been and where we come from. Um, and then it, you can see behind me, there's like a lot of plants, you know, it's a, it's, it reminds me that I come from people who've always lived in harmony with the earth, with growing things. You know, one of my students says that his mother, who's a Hmong elder, who's blind, um, whenever she hears that there are plants inside, she, inside houses, she's like, that is not Hmong. Plants belong in nature, not in houses, you know, but I, when I look at my own plants, I think about her and the truth of her words that we live, we come from a world in which plants are outside, not inside. You know, and yet I'm still reminded I'm a child, you know, of, of the plants in many ways. And so I can see these conversations behind me, which is to say that the essence of who I am and what I preserve, that it isn't um, simple. It's incredibly complicated. And all of these realities interlace to make us possible. So my children know that the Thai Yuzi have a garden. They know that once, you know, once we get through June, we'll start eating from the Thai Yuzi's garden. And that's kind of how it goes until we push it out into October, right? Until the last of like the um, fall, the pumpkins and the squash are done. And so in these ways, through the food we eat, um, elements of, of my culture remain strong inside of all of us. But also every single day, Cindy, when I get up, I'll say to Aaron, my husband, who is not mom, I'll say, Aaron is their rice. And now I don't need to say it anymore. Every morning when I get up, there's already rice in the rice cooker. We're a rice family, you know, without rice, my kids never feel like they've eaten, you know? And so there are countless ways in which everything that I am continues to be everything that I am. Yeah, sounds great. I know that in every house that I've lived in, in Minnesota, there was always a garden in our backyard too so definitely it's very nice to like even now I was just helping my mom garden just the other day and it just you know shows that we still have our old you know traditions of farming our old ways of farming with us even now that we're here in America so that's very nice to hear mm -hmm. oh so true and I'm so lucky Cindy I live by a mom grandma Thai, and so I'm horrible at tilling my garden it gets very weedy but this year I noticed that it was already tilled the other day I went out to look and she had already done it for me 
And I was saying to her, I say, I said, oh, no, you didn't have to. <laughs> and she said, of course I did, because it bothered me. And I, I, I am so appreciative, right, that even just beyond my own family, that my community survives around me and that these elders are able to impart the gift of their presence and their knowledge to me via these means. Yeah, I know that um, for me, I was not personally born in Laos or Thailand, but my parents were. So, um, you know, just because I did not go through any hardships like they did, um, I started to record my mom and dad's stories just because, you know, once they're gone, then who's going to be able to tell us the stories? Yes, there will be other elders there to tell their stories, but it's more, you know, it feels more personal once you hear your family's stories. Yeah. And I do love telling my mom and dad's stories, especially my dad's stories, because um, it goes all the way back when he was like a little boy. Like we recorded a good hour of him just trying to recall stories from when he was uh, from his first memories of being a little boy at a farm and slipping off of the little uh, barn house and rolling down the hill. <laughs> so yeah, in some ways, my family, we do try to record things the best that we can just because, you know, we don't know tomorrow what will happen, you know, and especially when they're gone, it's very nice to still hear their stories in the future too. So definitely those are some things that I would love to keep for life. Mm -hmm. And do you think that some stories should be told in private or should they be shared publicly or not publicly? Such an important question. It's a question that I ask myself all the time because I'm a writer and I'm a memoirist. Um, and the, the, the truth of the answer is yes, you can only tell the stories that you're brave enough to stand behind and beside and sometimes in front of. You know, that is really where your honesty with yourself as a person is so integral to the puzzle. I don't want my family to ever feel uh, violated or, or that they have been somehow made vulnerable because of the work that I do. I know what team I'm playing on, Cindy, and I think that is so integral to every decision that I make as a writer, as a storyteller, as a public speaker. Um, but so often you and I come from communities where we're all judged for the things that we've never been, right? And, and so in many ways, the people in my family say, let me be judged for who I am. Let the stranger that approaches me on the road know that I'm here because of these reasons and these forces and that this is the way I live. Because in the mystery of our houses, people, they suppose and they think and they imagine that they know what happens inside it. So, so much of my work is about making transparent um, these walls that hold us apart. And by, by walls, I'm talking, yes, um, like white centric lens, but I'm also talking about our own fears as, as a people to try to make our fears, our fears more transparent so that the space or our faith can grow into the spaces and places that it needs to grow. Um, so always I'm asking myself, Am I ready to tell this story yet? And I think that is why it's taken me well over a decade to tell the story of my mother. I knew as a 20 something year old that I wasn't ready and that I couldn't do a good job. When I held my daughter for the first time, I knew a little bit more about her story. When I saw her encounter the gravestone of her mother, I understood a lot more of her story. And so there are some stories that we have to be patient with, that we have to honor and honor the space of our lives. Um, and so, yeah, your question I think is so important. There is no need to rush a story that you're not ready to tell, that you don't have the courage and the confidence to stand behind, beside, and in front of. Um, I think that is super important. So yeah, some stories, you can practice telling them to the people you love most a thousand times a day, please but they're not quite ready to go outside of the house yet. And so being patient and being kind to yourself and the subjects that you're writing about and from and for, I think that is such an important question. It's a moral question though, at the heart of it. Some writers don't care. They see a great story and they're like, I'm gonna tell it. And I'm like, I wouldn't do it myself. Not yet, not until I'm wiser, not until I've had more time to think about the many different perspectives at play. But that's just the kind of writer I am and the kind of human being I am, I, a human being I am and the kind of communicator I am. I think it, it's so important to make sure 
that you've given yourself the time you've needed. Because we all need time to make sense of the big things in our lives. And communication as an act is about making sense of the world inside and the world outside. Yeah, and then speaking about time, um, what, would, what would it have meant to have heard a story about Hmong culture when you were in high school? Does representation matter? Of course. You know that the first time we saw Hmong in a book, my older sister had gone to college and I was still in high school and she had encountered Rano Takaki, Strangers from a Different Shore. And in this history of Asian Americans, there was a bit about Hmong people. And when she showed me that book, my hands started shaking because I couldn't believe it. We were real. We were real in the classroom in a way we had never been before. We were real in this world of ideas and the spectrum of history. I remember telling my mom and dad, we are real. And my mom looked at me and she said, we've always been real. You know, when I was a little kid, if a teacher was really kind, they would sometimes cut out um, white pages and print out like Hmong figures, and, and that would be the books. And I would be so thankful and so grateful. It wasn't until I held my very first children's book, right, A Map into the World, that I thought Hmong children deserve beautiful books too. So totally representation is critical to who we are and I think who we will become. There's no questions about it. And that is why I do the work that I do. Because it is hard to represent a people. You, you know this, there's a kind of pressure, no matter how I think about it and a responsibility that is on me, but you rise to the occasion because it matters. Yeah, I remember growing up. So in like elementary up until like middle school, it was kind of hard because I lived in the suburbs and, you know, we were the minorities and they're always like, what are you? What are you? And they would always, you know, get my nationality wrong. I'd be like, I'm Hmong. So, you know, growing up, it was hard because you didn't really see much of the Hmong culture in anything throughout high school or through elementary and middle school. And then in high school, they finally had like a, like one small page about Hmong people just quickly in our history book. And I thought that was really great. But, you know, at, at that time, I was really happy to uh, see that there was a section about our Hmong people. Um, but it was just a small section. I'm like, oh, I wish there could be more. But I know that recently I've been seeing more and more about how there's actually like small chapters about Hmong people now uh, in the history book. So it's definitely so great of what's happening nowadays. So. I really do think representation is a really big thing, especially for our future kids to grow up with that. Exactly. And we see that at play, right? With Sunisa Lee and the gold medal at the Olympics, the whole of the Hmong community was screaming so hard with joy. And right now, among literary circles, right, we're all trembling because Maidova is a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, like in poetry, a Hmong American author writing about yellow rain of all things, you know is a finalist for this incredibly prestigious literary prize. I mean, history is being made every single day by Hmong people. You know, the beauty about this current moment is that with our cell phones and, you know, with all these platforms, we can begin to highlight and, and we can begin to, to amplify each other in a way that has never been possible to us as a people. We've always waited for more stronger, powerful, um, populations to come and allow us, enable us to, 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 to showcase ourselves in these, these ways. But right now, hey, on Facebook, everybody's retweeting, you know, on Twitter, everybody's retweeting each other. On Facebook, we are, you know, sending our messages into the void again and again. So it's an incredible time. Definitely. And what do you find is the difference between public speaking and storytelling? What's the difference? So when I tell a story, I'll begin, especially if I'm just trying to have fun. I'll, I'll begin anywhere, but I will make it fantastic. I will surprise myself. I will speak to surprise myself. So I'm as, I'm as, as a storyteller, I'm as invested 
as my readers are in the experience. And that is pretty similar to what happens when I take a microphone. If I were any other kind of speaker, I would tell you I would have written it out and I'd be reading, delivering a speech, right? But I don't write my speeches. I've never written my speeches, whether the crowd is like five or whether the crowd is 5,000, I've never written a speech. Um, I go and I listen to the silence in a room. I listen to the space where I'm at. And then I speak. And when I'm at my best, Cindy, it is almost like the words are coming from somewhere else beyond me. It is like a gift. Like, like I become a vessel of something else when I'm truly at my best, which is what happens when I'm on the page when I'm writing. I forget time and I forget plot and I forget structure and the words are coming from somewhere else. And afterward, when I read it, I can't believe that those words have somehow, you know, come forth from these fingers, right? Um, in that way, the public speaking and the writing, there's always more at stake. Um, in the storytelling, I'm having so much fun. I'm, I'm in the playground, you know, I'm, I'm an adventure at the tree line of the woods. I can hear the stream. I can hear the calls of the wild animals, but it's up to me to, 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 to run and to chase, to peek quietly into the glen, to see the beauty that exists there. So it's a very different heart space that I'm working from. When I'm telling a story, I'm just writing to have fun. I'm just telling to, 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 to you know, keep, keep the energies, the fairies, right, alive. Um, but the writing and the public speaking, sometimes I become a vessel for something bigger than. All right. And do you think that um, public speaking and storytelling should be kept separate or should they intertwine? They've always lived together. You know, there's a story of a day. There's a story of the people we meet in a day. There's a story of the words that were said in a day. There's a story about the direction of the sun in a day. There's 10,000 different stories in a day. To be a good speaker, you have to be able to understand the many do different stories at play in a given moment. And you have to be definitive enough to choose a thread to follow. Um, I, I've always rested and relied on storytelling. Earlier when I talked about storytelling, you could hear I was talking about the oral form, right? When I'm teasing my kids, when I'm sitting in front of a classroom of first graders. Um, but for me, even with the formal speeches, it's always based on the stories. How did I get here? How did you get here? Why are we here together? Like for example, this moment, why is Galia, Cindy and Lori, why are we together in this room? Because a teacher had an idea and a teacher wanted this idea to play out in the world and for this moment to be captured for generations of learners to come still because what we have to offer today, Lori believes is worth preserving for different generations, right? We're here because of a heart merging with, with, with a mind. And, and so I'm always pulling in stories wherever I go. That's how you situate yourself. That's how you contextualize yourself. That's also the vehicle by which you will travel from your place to the place of another. Yeah. And then Kalia, uh, I think you worked with Jasna Harris with the environmental justice storytelling. How can stories help with persuasive advocacy purposes? Oh, that's such a good question. So I write for all kinds of um, initiatives. And in each, I write for the world that I want to belong to, which is to say that the heart of the mission is to say, here, something is at risk, something is worth saving. And perhaps your voice can, can support the call for us to look with more care. When I approached that particular pro project, environmental justice, I thought immediately, of course, about all of the planes flying across the skies that for me were like a child's dream, you know, but now I understand the implications, uh, climate change and, and all of that, that sadness, that travesty, that overuse, that trespass that we've made onto the earth itself. Um, when I write, I don't try to persuade though. And I think this is really important. I try to deepen the understanding of my readers for a situation and for a moment, for a moment that is bigger than theirs or mine where there is more of us on stake than neither of us knew. Uh, and so I'm always writing in search of a deeper understanding. And I think that is actually the most persuasive kind of writing there is. So many times my students will say, how do you craft a persuasive essay? And I'll say, how do you show me something I've never known about something, <laughs> right? Something that is right before me. 
Um, I have an essay called Dark Trees in the Landscape of Love in a collection by Song Yongshin. And that one is about, um, and I think it's so much, it explains the heart of your question right now. I'm walking with my nephew, Pong, and he says, what are your favorite trees? It's autumn time. All of the maples are blazing like flames. You know, the ash tree are yellow like apricots and raining down on us like a Korean drama. And I can't decide which trees I love the most. But he tells me, my favorite are the black trees. And Cindy, I couldn't see the black trees anywhere. I looked everywhere. And finally, when I was about to give up, he says, no, Auntie Galia, you're looking at it wrong. He points to the street and I see all of the black trees in the neighborhood interlaced. And I see something I've never quite seen before. That is the best persuasive essay. And that is how I think about the persuasive essay as a form. You point out to something that has always been there, but the person has never quite seen it the way you have, the way it is before. It is a truth that is undergirding the whole thing. And so as a vehicle, if you can do that via storytelling, if you can do that with authenticity and heart, then I think you're on the right team. And again, it is always about what team you're playing for. I'm playing for the you know, disenfranchised. I'm playing for the weak. I'm playing for the hungry. I'm playing for the unseen. I'm playing on behalf of like short women, okay? Uh -huh. All of these things. <clears throat> so that's how I think about it. And that's why I choose to go about it every time. Yeah. Um, and what is it about a story that might be more persuasive than facts? Like um, we'll use like environmental justice as an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, my husband tries to keep bees and we all know that we need pollinators, right? Pollinators in enable our fruits and our veggies and, and everything else that we love. So many of us love oranges, for example. Um, every single year the bees die in the winter. So pretty much he's been a bee killer for like, the last five years but every year he tries again and I think it's beautiful because he can't help it right he wants to help the world become a better place never mind that he's doing too much and the bees are just dying every year or not doing enough but I think all the time about Aaron definitely and then um Louisiana I think about New Orleans I think about the I think about all of the, that great flood that took so many lives and cost African-American people so much. I met the, the, the then director of like um, the US forces, like I forget the name, but when there's a major disaster, they go in and they have to somehow help people. And I asked him in light of Hurricane Katrina, I said, what did you do right? And what did you do wrong? And he said, we erred, we were too patient. And then we were too, 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 we had, such a great sense of urgency that we move too fast and we forgot too many things. And then he looked at me and he said, he's an old guy. He's like, in all of my life, that is always the truth. People make mistakes when they're either being too patient or too impatient. You know, I, I think about these forces at play all the time when I'm, when I'm in the work of like trying to get the world to see. And I try to be patient. I'm never the first writer when there's like a horrible tragedy or something incredible happening in the world. I'm never the first writer, not because I'm not fast because I tend to be very fast on the page, <clears throat> but because I'm like that horse at the races, Cindy. I, if you let me go, I will run too far fast and I will, I, I will hurt myself or hurt others. And so I understand the importance of putting that gate in front of me. I'm like, you're not gonna write anything into three weeks, Kalia. And that's been a saving grace for me personally in the work that I do, the environmental work that I believe in, in the way that I choose to live. I try to slow myself down enough so I can see what other people around me are doing, how they're responding. And then, and then I'll let myself out. And I never want to outrun anyone. That's not interesting to me. I want to know how it feels to run the races for something that matters every step of the way. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And how do you think, or how might we change speech and English composition classes to include more storytelling or to encourage kids or students to tell more stories along with the speeches that they wanna do? I love this question because I, I believe I come from a, a, 
a small sect of teachers of writing who believe that people should be able to write with their accents on the page. There's a story and that story has to be from them and who they are. So often, it, particularly in writing and communication, we want to teach students how to sound a certain way. And we forget that that method, that particular way is carved by certain people, just a class, a tiny little class of people, you know? And so I'm always out for like saying, if my student is writing with, you know, a thick accent on the page, that there are many chicken, makes as much sense as chickens, right? And, and so I'm always chasing after a bigger, deeper kind of meaning. You know, when my one of my most students said, knife to the throat of a chicken, I know exactly, I know exactly what they mean. That feeling, that urgency. If you ever killed a chicken, you know. If you've ever watched anybody kill a chicken, you know, you know. And yet I can also see some of my other white students who've never interfaced with the world of chicken killing, despite the fact that some of them eat chicken as well. They're like, that's so graphic. And I'm like, no, it's not, not relative to, to, to this person's perspective. It's not, you know? Um, and so always I'm advocating for a world in which people should tell their stories however they need to tell them versus telling them in one way, quote, the right way. You know, and this has to do with storytelling, it has to do with speech making, it has to do with everyday talk. I just taught a course on pacing, Cindy, and my students, Yes, we talked about how you can speed up and slow down pacing, how it's like the brake in a car that I want them to be able to control. But I also really wanted them to reflect deeply. What kind of writers do you give a lot of room for? You know, what kind of writers do you feel like you can wait for like 10 pages of them, you know, rambling around versus the kind of writer where you're like, this is bad, I'm gonna put it aside, right? So it's really about paying attention to yourself and what you privilege and what you honor and what you value on a page and be aware of that as you go onto the page as a reader or a writer. Um, and so always I'm advocating for reflectivity and then also care. You gotta care enough to make, it, make the world as big as it needs to be to hold all of the stories, all of the truths that reside in it at any given moment in time. All right, and what do we gain when we add or uh, written or orally sharing stories into the curriculum of public speaking class? Greater truth, greater perspective, greater depth. Yes, we can talk about compassion and care, but at the end of the day, we become, I think, truly more educated in the truest sense of the word. We understand better what it is like to be a measly human being in a world that is much bigger than we, in a world that is far more diverse than the and the, you know, the structure of our personal experiences. And I think that's all that matters in the end. I've never met an elder who is uneducated. They've had a lot of room to learn how to talk. They've had a lot of room and space to listen. And now that the days are a number, there's a lot that they want to leave behind. And what tips would you um, give to encourage students like me or other students in the future in writing or sharing stories uh, for an oral representation or presentation? One, be honest. Be honest with yourself. Honor your fears. If you're afraid of public speaking, understand that fear and make room for it. To be a good public speaker, speaker is not to like suppress that fear or to pretend it isn't there. Make room for it in who you are and how you present. You know, um, I, I also want to say you've got to be kind to your readers to your audience, you have to be kind to them, which is to say, you have to understand that maybe you need to say something more than one way for them to get it. You know, your audience also deserves more than one chance. I think a, a lot of public, young public speakers, they trip themselves up because they're like, I did my best and nobody understands. And I'm like, that means that they deserve more chances than you've given them which is, of course means more work for you, right? Because you're gonna have to reconstruct and you're gonna have to refine and you're gonna have to resituate. Um, so that would be my second one. And third, I think in terms of the public speaking and the oral presentation, you have to listen to yourself. Other people will hear you the way you hear yourself. So often, 
uh, young public speakers, myself included, I raced to the end. I wanted to make it as short as possible, you know, that my pain and their pain, I assumed it was equally painful. I didn't, it took me a long time to understand we deserve the time and the space and the place to deliver pieces of who we are to the world. We deserve it. We should take it. We should own it. We should make good use of it. Yeah, like as a student for me, myself, I know that when I was taking public speaking class uh, with Lori, I was very nervous because I'm like, yes. we're doing a story about something and I was telling my dad's story and I'm like, are they going to even like it? Will they even listen? But I just, you know, I was honest, like what you said, be honest. So I was being honest to myself. I just, you know, I wanted to do that story about my father. So I went ahead and did it. And at the end, I just hoped like maybe some of them will like it. But at the end, Lori was like, that was fantastic. That was very good. Now I was really surprised because I'm like, in my head, I thought maybe nobody would care. But at the end of it all, when Lori was like, that was very good. I felt like, oh my gosh, did I just do something really great? And, you know, ever since then, public speaking became easier once I wasn't afraid to tell the stories anymore that I was ready to tell. So with all the things that you went over today, I think it will be very helpful for future students, um, especially the part where you said, you know, don't be afraid to be judged for who you are. Um, you know, just go ahead, be honest and tell your story. So I think that would be really helpful for future students to take that on and think about it when they do their uh, speeches and to include stories. And that would definitely make everything a lot easier. I feel like telling stories easier when you do your speech because it just flows together like a book, right? That was beautiful, Cindy. Like my teacher's heart is like high-fiving Lori. So thank you. Yeah. And then Lori, did you have anything else to add? Well, I do want to thank you both. <clears throat> you both have shared so much of who you are. And again, Dr. Tucker would say, every communication act asks, who am I? Who are you? What are we doing here together? And I think this conversation that we had here together is important because what you just mentioned to us that we deserve to own it and we deserve to have our story shared. And it takes time and courage to do that, as both of you had mentioned. And sometimes we don't have as much time to develop a story or a speech. And so we can borrow other stories or create our ethos and pathos in a message by reading, uh, using quotes from Kalia from some of your books, might find their way into a speech course when a person may not have had time or perhaps um, have thought through some of the same topics. And in many cases, just plain old love what it is that you wanted to share with the world already. And so whether we're sharing other stories as an author, bringing that author credibly, quoting them with who, where, and who, where, and, um, and when, right? Cindy, you always have to say your sources, right? Um, but I think it's so important that we can share other stories, whether it was a story that was published or if it was part of our ancestral story, or perhaps even an imagined story that we have for the future. And so I really thank you both for sharing who you were, who you are, and uh, what we're doing here together. I'm wondering if either of you wanted to end with um, any of the readings that you found significant uh, for a final statement. Cindy, would you like to go first? Uh, let's see, from a reading, there's just so many though. <laughs> so like, it's hard for me. Um, all I know is that one thing that really stuck to me is from reading one of your books. Again, it'll, it'll be the one about, you know, the one about my aunt's family. It's not per se the words on the book, but it's like the illustration that really got to me. Uh, in the shared room, there is a page of a little boy crying, and that would be the brother, you know, realizing, you know, that he, they'll have to move on and that he's going to get the room for himself now and I felt like you know that page didn't even have words on it but the illustration that you guys put in it had so much emotion in there yeah yeah that page I wasn't able to find it but definitely that page when I looked at that photo I took a good 10 minutes and I was literally crying I was crying because just that photo like 
just knowing the person or the family, it just gets to you. So I took a little break. I had to take a little break because I'm like, you know, just that photo was, it had so much emotion and meaning in there. So I just feel like that was a really great part of that book. Like, even if it's considered a children's book, it, it has a way bigger meaning than for children, for adults, for anyone, basically. So I felt like that photo inside the book meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was really beautiful. The I'll tell C writer, the illustrator, when I, when I see her, because I think she would love to hear that. Um, so right now I'm reading this book. A Strange Beast of China in translation. In the fall, I'll teach a class about you know, finding inspiration in a bigger world. And it's a book, uh, it's a class about work in translation. Um, and so I'll just read a little, a little bit about, a little bit from this. Um, Every beast has a beastly nature. At the full moon, human children ought to stay at home. My mother would say, the bees all want to eat people just as people eat them. Mutual destruction is the only way to survive. That's the circle of life. That's truth. Everyone would give up their hollow pursuits and there'd be no myth, no beast, no history, no fantasy. The government would rattle along printing money. Yangon would truly become an international metropolis. I think, you know, whenever I read anything that connects like the mythic world, with the world that we know, any critique of it, I'm moved. You know, like young Galia was moved by moved by George Orwell, and now old Galia, older Galia, is looking for inspiration around the world. And I'm finding pieces of it here because it's talking about the beast that I know, the beast that I fear, the beast that is inside of me, that is that is inside all of us. And I think what would happen if we all just did what we needed to do. It would truly be a world without the legends, the myths, the beasts, the magic. You know, so, so those words are lingering with me today. Well, thank you both for sharing your time with, with our immediate audience, the three of us together with this conversation. I enjoyed stepping back and thank you so much, Cindy, for taking the lead on the questions. And it's not an easy thing to interview someone, especially someone who's famous and who has moved uh, emotions in so many individuals. And thank you too, Kalia, for continuing to share the stories. And as a listener, I have to share with both of you that I have been moved with the importance of family when you shared your story in class, Cindy, how important. And I gotta tell you, Cindy knows the value of a time limit. You got through those time limits on that one speech. Um, and at the same time, I, I wish we could have sat for hours and listened to stories like you're now sharing. And you've inspired me and I too am sharing um, stories of my, my parents and my great grandparents and having met my ancestors um, stories through my parents and trying to record those. And so I encourage others to do that, but also to write them and to share them with your family. And as we end this, I do want to tell you too, Kalia, that I was able to listen to you when you came to Rochester. And I was with my oldest child who has had a loss of, of several miscarriages and the stories that you share, whether it's a specific culture or a specific story or a specific loss, as well as the joys that you've shared, they can touch us deeply in a way that shows that intercultural communication is possible, is necessary, because the losses that you have experienced or given voice to in the many books that you've written and stories, the voice you gave to Cindy's family, those are important voices that are now shared, like you said, with the world. And they're voices that have met me personally when Cindy told me in our conversation that you felt like you were in the room. You know, just the other day you told me that when we were preparing for the interview. And Kalia, when you were sharing, you know, I, I held my child's hand and, um, and I just, I just took in your words and your wisdom and your hope for starting again and for finding joy. And of course, the wonderful wisdom of someone as young as your nephew. And thank you for sharing and giving voice to those stories. In our classes and communication, we do ask people to share and it is scary, but this is the result. The result is that something lingers past us 
and that the Communication Act is far greater than what we can diagram with the triangle of meaning or, or put down in an essay exam or a multiple choice, that it is communicating. And just like exercising or cooking, we can't do that in our head. We have to do it. We have to do it verbally and non-verbally. And I thank you both for that time today to do just that. Thank you so much. It's such a joy, Cindy, to be in conversation with you. Thank you for the thoughtfulness of your questions and for sharing so much of yourself. And Lori, for masterminding and facilitating this exchange. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank you guys both, especially Lori, for hanging on to me after your class has ended. Uh, it's been really great, you know, keeping in touch with someone like a professor that I didn't know that we would grow close or be working together. Um, and it's really changed me as a person. I didn't think like two semesters ago, I would be speaking to an author like Kalia. Uh, so I really want to thank you guys both for giving me this opportunity. And it, you know, it's very inspirational, makes me want to, you know, keep going and stay strong and share stories more to anyone who's willing to listen. Well, thank you. All. Thank you.